fabulous. Okay. All right, well, welcome everybody. Welcome to our Ascolite Learning Design Special, Special Interest Group April webinar. Myself, Kashmira Dave and Keith Haggard. Um, Keith is our new um, leader as part of our leadership team, welcomes everybody to our session. We are, um, we have a very interesting session today and quite a, um, a hot topic today as well, based on feedback from our community in the area of uh, design thinking in higher education. But before we get into that, I do would like to um, encourage people to have a think about joining our special interest group and the QR code is available on screen. In our uh, special interest group, we hold monthly webinars, we have reading groups, we also um, have podcasting that's coming up. And also, again, based on feedback from our community, we are looking at hosting some Alexa um, design labs as well, which our team members will also talk a bit about more later uh, towards the end of this session. So we hope this session will kickstart that as well. Our Ask Light conference is coming up. Um, it's held at the University of Sydney later in the year. So feel free to have a look at that as well. Now, before we begin, I, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of our lands um, at the moment of our land. Also, on behalf of our Ascolite Learning Design Special Interest Group, um, the traditional owners of our land in which we are meeting. I'm currently um, um, situated within the Wurrung lands by the Kulin Nations. And please feel free to also acknowledge your um, where you're at as well. I pay my respects to our elders past and present and emerging, emerging and extend that to respect all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across our lands. We have two special uh, guests uh, today for our webinar. So our learning design webinar is on exploring the value of design thinking for higher education. So design thinking has been around for quite some time and it's been used in our corporate sector for uh, looking at multidisciplinary teams to come together to creatively problem solve unique ideas as well. It's interesting, it's gaining a lot of momentum uh, recently as well. And we will hear from Susan McFarlane and Jane um, Kettle about our, how they've used um, design thing as part of curriculum design and learning design in higher education as well. So, and, and looking at the different definitions and principles in that space and how we could actually look at the, you know, different processes and tool sets and how um, they could apply this this approach into their practice and also in our own practices as well. So Susie McFarlane is an associate professor, um, Learning Futures within the Learning Innovations team in the Faculty of Health at Deakin University. Her research and practice focus on promoting the agency and unleashing the creativity of students and educators in higher education. And her strategic leadership is informed by her background as a psychologist and educator and her studies in design, computing systems thinking and participatory uh, leadership. Jane Cadell um, is a lecturer in um, at Deakin as well, so a lecturer in Learning Futures in the Learning Innovations team in house who works with Susie. She's been digressing at the boundaries of education and learning technology for more than 20 years. So Jane thrives on working together with academics, learners and colleagues to co-create authentic, inclusive learning experiences and strategic projects using human-centred and design thinking approaches. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Jane and Susie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leanne. And it's um, really lovely to uh, be here with the Learning Design Special Interest Group. Um, if you'll bear with me, I'll share my screen. Um, we won't do too much um, PowerPoint. But um, we will start with some introductions and uh, definitions. So um, that was a great intro. And just as a bit of background, I am an educator. I've been designing learning experiences and media for higher education um, in the health sector and in workplace education for a really long time. And working formally with design thinking and co-design, co-creation models and practices since about 2016. I've been really lucky enough to have worked with Susie McFarlane for um, around the last seven years. So Susie, um, as Leanne said, the Associate Director of Health in the Learning Innovations team at Deakin University. 
Um, and Susie and I, uh, in the last three years, when I joined Deakin, have been working to evolve and um, apply these design thinking processes and practices to unit redesign and our strategic project development work. Um, so I just before I launch in, I just wanted to also acknowledge um, indeed that I'm here on Wurundjeri land, um, unceded Wurundjeri land, and I'd also like to acknowledge the expertise and the lived experience and the diversity of everybody here today. Um, this is definitely not a, we know all about design thinking, we really want to hear um, and share some experiences as a group um, as part of this session today. Um, in a normal or a different forum using design thinking, we would absolutely start on spending time with introductions and relationships. Um, the limitations of a webinar and the time factors mean that we're going to take a few shortcuts today. But um, with that in mind, Susie's going to um, give us a quick poll, I think, on the screen, um, which is going to ask you uh, just to get a sense of your relationship with design thinking and whether you love it and use it all the time, whether you've been to some workshops and they were okay, whether you're a bit skeptical, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit too much about post-it notes and jazz, um, or whether you're really not sure and you're here to find out um, what's going on. And so there's a little bit of voting. Yeah, I'm quite, quite excited to see that a few people have been to some workshops and they were okay. And I feel like um, it's it's fine to say I've run some workshops that are not okay, and I'm sure all of us have been to some design thinking style post-it note fests where it felt a bit one way, and that we might have been harvesting um, people's ideas. You know, the um, I'd like to pick your brain approach, which again probably isn't what this is about. And I'll get Susie to share the results of the poll in a moment. There's a few more people still to vote. Um, and then we'll move into something which is very design thinking um, in, in its approach. We'll just start with an exercise. Jane, I have um, shared those results. Oh, beautiful. Thanks, Susie. So we have... Um Quite a few folk who have, uh, love it and use it all the time, eight um, participants and about 17 have been to some workshops and they're okay. And I I didn't add in the option to I'm here to find out apologies. So we haven't got that one, that option, but we've got probably a third of people who've been using it a lot and two thirds um, some of the time. And and a skeptic as well, which is great. Which is great. Because we... <laughs> <Yes. laughs> we like a bit of that as well. I love it. Thanks so much, Susie. All right, so the next um, thing, and I'll change my slide over here. Um, and we do have in the chat a link to a mural board. Now, many of you have probably come across um, Mural or Miro or Google Jam boards, one of those big collaborative whiteboards. If you've been do, working in this space as long as me, you might have used Illuminate about a million years ago to do similar sorts of things, but um, maybe not as, as beautifully. Um, and, and at very essence, you know, something like a Google Doc does um, more or less the same thing, a space to share. But um, one thing we'd like to ask you to do, we're just going to take two minutes, is to start with your expertise and what you know. So we'd like you to share something you know about design thinking and that might, that might actually be, I'm going to jump out of my um, PowerPoint here and take you over and share the screen, which is a little bit crazy. And I'll also um, hide cursors so we don't end up um, seeing too much going on here. Um, but for those of you that haven't seen a mural board or used one of these, um, navigation is a little bit of a hurdle. They're not as immediate as Padlet. Um, so you do have a little navigation box down the bottom of the screen here. Um, if you're using um, a desktop like I am, mouse mode is your best friend. If you're using um, an iPad, flip into trackpad mode and that will make life easier. But the, the basics are you can zoom with your scroll wheel, you can hold the board and move it around to navigate, and you can double click to create a post-it note and start typing. So I am going to use what's part of my shtick with these sorts of workshops 
um, just a little timer on my phone. And if I wasn't using a headset, you'd hear my cheesy ringtone when the time's up. But we are just going to take two minutes um, and just add some stuff to the board, do a bit of sharing so that we can look and see um, and shortcut that relationship building. And for those of you that are new to this, um, what's something you'd like to know? What are you curious about? And we're getting some fantastic responses here. I'm just being a bit cheeky with the icons. I'd encourage you to do the same if you're interested over here. Um, star anything you like, any good ideas. And we're getting some good questions as well, which we'll spend some time on um, in the second half of today. Oh, I love this one time it seems to take so long we will be talking a bit about that today all right that's my cheesy ringtone i'm going to stop sharing again um, by virtue of of the the medium that we're in today in a design thinking session we'd spend quite a bit of time talking about this asking what people had put down having some conversations which does go to that time building um, comment over here um, this will stay open um, ongoing throughout the session. So if you think of anything, jump back in and, and add comments and ideas. And you'll notice we've also got a resources section up here that we can add to. Um, if you have any fabulous resources you want to share, please put them in here as well. And this will be a bit of an ongoing resource um, for the session. Now I'm going to jump back into here and do the classic share the PowerPoint again. So. Design thinking um, is uh, a term that we've heard a lot about probably in the last 20 to 30 years um, in a lot of different spaces. Human-centered design is another um, bucket, if you like, or way of talking about, about these sorts of processes and methodologies. But really, I think um, it's not a new thing. Certainly in the late 50s and early 60s in the business realm, there was lots of design and creativity models that um, approaches like participatory design, uh, things like user experience design came out of these spaces, product design, uh, beautiful Don Norman and, you know, uh, teapots with backwards handles. Um, human factors and ergonomics also delved into this space um, about the, the user, the person at the centre. And co-creation models, there's so many variations of these um, in art, in social development, in community building, in business. So there's a lot of overlap and themes and ideas um, about design thinking. But when we start um, new at this, there's a couple of models that often get quoted. Um, one of them is the British Design Council Double Diamond, which you can see here, um, which is about divergent and convergent thinking. It's a model to prompt um, people to, uh, starting with a problem, to really go big and discover some insights into what's actually going on before they define down to what they're actually going to focus on and try and solve with a design brief, design brief or, or a definition. And then using, once they've got that, that idea locked in, how they're going to solve it and using the same processes of dive, diverging and converging with ideas and prototypes. Stanford is, um, this, uh, this model is also extremely well known. Um, it's a very linear model, which sometimes gets at a bit of critique. Um, and it takes people through a step by step process of empathising, then defining ideas, ideating, which is, you know, if we're talking about buzzwords, that's that's a beauty, brainstorming, coming up with lots of ideas, um, and then that idea of prototyping and testing. So they're two that you might be very familiar with. 
Um, IDEO is the other company that often gets quoted in this what is design thinking um, question. And this isn't a, a model for process. This is about how you design for innovation. So this model is um, quite a nice one because it talks about starting with people, start with what's desirable, what do people actually want, what's gonna make sense for them, and then bring in all of those other constraints, which are usually top of the list what's going to work in the context of our organisation, what's going to work for learners, um, what's going to work with the LMS, the technology the, that, that we have, and the support processes around that. And if you can bring all of that together, you get to innovation where in those overlaps. So because there's so many definitions, and IDEO themselves says there's no definition, they talk about it in terms of it being an idea or a strategy or a method, um, how do we make sense of it for ourselves? And some of the themes and principles that, that run through these different um, ways of working in a human-centered design approach are these ones. So empathy gets talked about often, the mindset of empathy, putting assumptions to one side and seeking insights into context and challenges and needs and opportunities. Um, the next one in orange is my favourite. It's love the problem, not the solution. So in our line of work, in working with academics to design um, online uh, content and learning experiences, we often have um, the situation where someone comes along and says, I need a video. When I worked in um, uh, workplace learning, it would often be, we need an e-learn to solve this problem. And design thinking would say, absolutely, you do not need that. Um, let's start with talking about why you think you need that. Um, so that's a really powerful shift, I think. Um, it's about being very open and exploratory, um, being flexible. And collaboration and co-creation is at its heart. And implicit in that is um, the power and who gets to make the design decisions. And also really practical stuff, like iterate it, do a few versions and do them together and test them and get some good rich feedback as you go through. So one of the ways that Susie and I started to make sense of this um, as, as a way of working was to think about it as a methodology. And we had lots of conversations about the mindsets implicit in design thinking. This has come from a business context. How is it going to apply to working in, in a learning space, in a higher education space, um, when it's you know got these quite corporate origins? Um, in, in, in a lot of places. So with the mindsets, we're talking about things, we talked about empathy, we're talking about um, really putting yourself into a sharing mindset as a group of people. Um, sitting with ambiguity is another really powerful one. This is uncomfortable, goes back to that beautiful post-it note at the start. It takes time, it's not quick and efficient and it's very different to ADI models and IT versions of, of building a product and getting it done and meeting the milestones. That's not what this is. Um, processes, um, when I'm talking about processes here, this is about what does, what does all this stuff that we do and the thinking that we do sit within? And this could be a double diamond approach um, as a way of framing. It could be that you're doing a design sprint, which is very form, you know, very um, rigid in the way it tells you to work through these processes. Um, and the tool sets, the fun stuff, this stuff, you know, the workshop um, games, the tools, the thinking exercises, which um, have, you know, align really closely to things that um, Edward de Bono was talking about, you know, prompts, things that will help you to very quickly constrain and shift thinking and generate great ideas. So mindsets, processes and tool sets are one way that we've sort of approached it. But having said that, and I've jumped to my slide too soon, I was going to get Susie to put up um, another poll for us. And that is around critique. So we hear a lot of, this is fantastic, design thinking, it's colourful, it's fun. We've, many of us have, I think there were 17 people who said they'd been to a workshop. Now, sometimes you can go to a workshop and there's great cake and you meet interesting people and you do some stuff and you stand up, certainly pre-COVID, and they were great experiences, lots of adrenaline, lots of um, theatre, lots of sharing, and they felt great. Um, but sometimes, um, conversely, there's, there's not great experiences in those things. They can feel a bit 
formulaic. Uh, they can have the superstar facilitator who's sort of, you know, running the whole thing um, and not necessarily be about bringing the group together. So I'm interested to hear from you about what you think um, design thinking is. Is it a transformative experience? Is it just more buzzwords and hype? Um, or are you still not sure because it's quite big and complicated? I've just shared those, you. Jane. Can you see those now? I can, yes. So 26 responses. Do you want to um, summarise those for us, Susie? So no response so far, 26 folks. So um, people might be cautious or we might not have given them an option that makes sense for them. <laughs> um, <laughs> True. Tra transformative is um, eight folk buzzwords and hype. We've got two and I still have no idea, seven. Oh, good mix. Yeah. Thank you, Susie. So um, Natasha Jen is the opposite of having no idea. She's a, a very um, well, you know, renowned graphic designer. And in 2017, she put out this TED talk, um, very plain speaking, design thinking is bullshit. Um, she talks about it very much in terms of hype and buzzwords. And we've been living with this for some time as designers, because um, it has got its origins in, in um, you know, art and product design, creative work. Um, and she's got a real problem with it. She says it's it doesn't embody the, the crit that's implicit in her uh, practice and that it's basically at challenges the role of the designer. So she's quite, um, she feels quite diminished, I think, by the, the idea of design thinking and of uh, the theatre and the, you know, the post-it notes and the hoo-ha. So I don't agree with her critique, um, but some of you might. And Susie's going to have a chat now about um, what that what that might mean. Yeah, so I think um, we, we feel it's also important to engage in criticism um, when we, when you do take a critical position that that it's informed um, and and constructive. So this quote. Um, illustrates, uh, I'll just read it out, I can't imagine what kind of process the author has experienced. This is a design thinking approach. Um, but it clearly has nothing much to do with the inclusive multidisciplinary process that I'm used to orchestrating. Um, so this il illustrates that when we unpack criticism of design thinking, as with criticism of anything, it, it may be poor practice, a poor quality version of that thing that's being critiqued rather than um, the qualities of design thinking itself. So, um, and, and sometimes um, criticism can come from a position of not having been immersed in design thinking as a practice. And I certainly, um, I'd be interested to hear from others' experience, but I have found that it's taken me a year, maybe two years to become a little bit familiar with design thinking practices to be able to have that sense when I'm in those workshops with, with Jane or planning things what things are working and what we need to do to get things back on track. And we do engage in a, a self critique and reflective analysis and anticipatory reflection um, critique as well before, during and after the workshop processes and practices that we do. <coughs> so we ask ourselves, <coughs> um, how are our participants or our co-designers um, feeling? Is, is there trust and participation going on? Um, are we holding the space to focus on the powerful questions that are going to have a big impact, not the, the detail. And, and do we, have we spent enough time understanding the problem space um, rather than jumping into um, solutionising? So they're the kind of processes that we go through in, in self um, critique and, and also constantly checking in with people about how they're, how they're feeling and adapting the processes as we need. Thanks, Jane. So, um, what is the um, opportunity there for design thinking in, in learning design and curriculum design and other um, pra practices in, in higher education? What's, um, wh what do we know so far? Thanks, Jane. This um, slide is a summary of some of the points that were made in the article by Associate Professor Jacqueline Broadbent and J Associate Professor Jason Lodge, who um, published this in, in 2020 and um, both are, those folk have been known to many people here, I think. Um, and so they've talked about um, uh, 
um, the flexibility of design thinking has been used as Jane's outlined in many sectors. Um, so including business, arts, creativity, and of course, design, engineering, and so on. Um, so it could be easily applied, that flexibility allows it to be easily applied to curriculum design, teaching, um, strategic projects, and research. In fact, we um, have experience in, in all of these areas. Secondly, there's a strong tradition of design in education and, and thinking of the work of Peter Goodyear here, um, and as well as the work um, uh, published by Bennett et al in 2016, talking about design thinking's contribution, uh, talking about the, the way the design has contributed to higher education through curriculum design, instructional design and pedagogical design. Um, and the work of Peter Goodyear, I think, is particularly um, interesting for design thinking in that he talks about design patterns. And for us working in design thinking, we think about when we're in those workshops, offering a, a combination of flexibility um, and openness versus structure. And so we are facilitating and then providing an open bucket or an open space for whatever the participants are bringing to, to come in. So we have it like a template or a blueprint or a design pattern, and then the participants and the quest students and the other stakeholders can contribute to what's in those buckets. So there's already a really rich tradition of design um, in, in education. And in the last five or six years, there's more research emerging of effective application of design thinking in higher education. And um, we've got references at the end of this, um, these slides that you can explore um, later on. Um, and importantly, we think that um, the, the, the principles and practices of design thinking that we've talked about so far, and we'll, Jane will talk about in a bit more detail, really does a terrific job of decentering or um, Un, you know, kind of challenging and um, helping folk move away from that lone ranger model of design that we've probably had in academia where we individually work on, on our curriculum design. So um, there's there's a lot of affordances there for, for higher education, um, uh, the potential of design thinking in higher education. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Susie. Um, so one of the... Uh, we talked a bit about the, the language um, of, you know, design thinking. It, it, it's a it's a thing. It's a it's an ecology. It's a methodology. Whatever. Um, Co-design um, is another very um, specific space. But again, with those overlaps, I think this is really important. And I, I will. You probably can't necessarily see it in my tiny screen, but I'll wave this book around. Um, came out in 2020 by. Um, K.A. McKercher, an Australian academic, and she defines four key principles for co-design. Um, one is about sharing power in that decision making, um, and one is about prioritising relationships, um, so work, group, working with collaborative groups um, in a participatory way, really um, building trust and understanding to get to good outcomes and building capability in the people in those groups to design together, which is very at odds with um, Natasha Jen's critique and experience of coming as an expert designer into a design space. So while this is coming from um, a social uh, development model, I think it's got real application here for the work that we do in higher education. So now I'll just give you a couple of um, quick stories about how what it actually looks like um, and this is you know probably a very busy slide to have a look at but I wanted to just when when Susie and I started doing this we had a, a we decided to do a one-day workshop and I think I'd originally said oh, could we have a, a you know two half days and we had the constraint of the academics time and expectations so what we did um, was to meet and prepare individually with the people coming to that workshop. And this was for a, a unit redesign project um, that was quite high stakes. And we've also applied this same mo model and method to a strategic um, development of some uh, resources around um, consent in teaching spaces. So we met and, and with these different groups, um, connected the, the teams and told them what we were going to do. Now, then we launched into this one day workshop, which we did quite a um, succinct plan for. And I should say that because Susie and I had worked together and we had a really good history of working in partnership and, and a lot of trust, um, that, that really helped us. So I've certainly, we've certainly had um, some epic failures with, with a workshop model where we go in too fast and, and, and too far. Um, so being flexible, 
and listening to where people are at um, seems to be one of the, the success um, indicators for this way of working. So in that one day workshop, we spent the morning acknowledging that the people in the unit redesign had done a significant amount of work and research on, on the changes they wanted to make. They had a lot of data, they had um, scores about student satisfaction, they'd interviewed students and they had a really good sense of, of um, what students wanted to see in terms of change. So we spent the morning of that one day workshop um, listening um, to what everybody wanted to share, what was top of mind and what was important to them. And, and it really um, shortcut um, assumptions because we're talking in, uh, about that together at the same time. So by the time we got to lunch, um, Susie and I sat down and went, goodness, that worked quite well. Um, and what are we going to do? Because the remainder of that very formal workshop that we'd planned wasn't going to work for the, the way people had responded and where we needed to get to by the end of the day. So we rapidly changed that and combined a couple of exercises around what were the opportunities and challenges and what were the changes those academics wanted to see based on all of the feedback and input that they discussed. And we mapped that across um, a timeline. And we followed that up with some smaller meetings and we used Microsoft Teams the whole way through to share the stories of that workshop. So we took photos of all of those beautiful boards, which I'll show you in a minute. And we um, shared that back in the form of a PowerPoint. This is what you did in that workshop. These are the outcomes you agreed on. And we did um, use some design thinking tools around um, effort and impact matrices to really quickly in about 10 minutes prioritise and project plan. So it was quite a different um, way of working. And then we iteratively worked on that unit redevelopment using teams um, and with lots of feedback as we went through. And you know that's I'm sure we've all got pictures of these on the day, you know, it, there was great catering and it was pre-COVID and we had some amazing ideas out of being in this hothouse environment, walking around, putting things up. But we managed to get the follow through on that through resharing those stories and using teams asynchronously um, and meeting and prompting um, all the way through. So the other thing about flexibility, of course, is COVID happened. And so we just got quite comfortable with running these workshops at the end of um, 2019. And we'd geared up for a whole you know, half year of we're going to do these ones and this is how it will go. And suddenly we had to take it all online. And there was quite a bit of um, discussion about what this looks like in an online space. Uh, we ended up um, you know, I won't say making it up as we go along, but adapting um, as we went along. And we worked out a, a sort of four workshop approach. We discovered Mural as an online collaborative tool. And we were still using Teams as a way of um, working people through a process. And there were so many, we went from a, a sort of two, three week constrained process where we had that one day workshop to something that was much more evolved over four to eight weeks and indeed one project that went for about four months um, on a redeveloping a, a course major. So again the principles behind this are really the same, listening and sharing um, in that first workshop, uh, doing prompting making the space to really take on where people were at with the work that they'd already done. Um, we challenged them to then go and interview somebody else, somebody that they hadn't spoken to, somebody else that might have a view on this. In some cases, it might have been students. In some cases, it was external um, practitioners, uh, other colleagues who ran units that fed into the units that we were working on. And we spent the second workshop asking them to share those insights. and the richness of the conversations that came out of those discussions, um, it fundamentally shifted um, the end, use, end, end, end products that we ended up developing. Um, by spending time with those insights and not just acting on them immediately in between workshops, there's usually a couple of, um, you know, a week or so in between each of these, um, we then got to a point at workshop three when we would do what you traditionally think of um, as you know, the brainstorming and the post-it notes, again, online. And through that process and having that bit of extra time, we were able to develop our ideas offline and build those prototypes and priorities and plans. So a couple of things, and I've mentioned the interviews, that reframing is really important. Um, 
Susie, did you want to talk about that switch that you that you um, mentioned where academics were looking at the units not as content? Sure, Jane. Yeah, that was the biggest <clears throat> um, transformation that that I saw with the design thinking approach helped through that empathy mapping and spending time um, thinking about the problem space and mapping the curriculum and the assessment tasks. Um, academics really started to see not that just their content um, and the information they were trying to share with students, but that their unit was a, a journey, a learning, a learning experience and a journey. And it, um, they could, we did some um, persona work as well, um, where we started to imagine um, the student experience, you could see their multiple assessments or within a few weeks or that we hadn't built up enough of their uh, knowledge in a certain area before that we were asking them to apply that knowledge and so on. So it really shifted their perspective from here's the content I want to deliver to here's the experience um, I'm designing. So that, that was transformational. Um, and we also saw a lot of academics in um, who can be prone to perfectionism <laughs> um, kind of open up and, and be a little bit more prepared to sit with the the immersive kind of messiness and uncertainty that we we're asking them to sit with. So those two kind of mindsets and capabilities um, were really me meant that then the foundation of um, the next steps were built up where uh, the, 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 the primacy of the student experience was so strong and the fact that people were willing to go into these um, quite um, collaborative um, emergent conversations with us. Beautiful. Thanks, Susie. Um, and look, the other thing that I'll, I'll mention um, before we make some space to, to talk to you is this idea of um, the visual mapping and that iteration, um, revisiting uh, things. Again, it goes back to that taking time. Um, we certainly had um, one academic talk about, he felt, said he felt like he was spinning his wheels. It's uncomfortable. It does go back to that ambiguity principle, but uh, that having that time saves time. In a, in a more traditional model, you would have a request, you'd build something, different people would annotate feedback, give you feedback, the, the designer would go away and rebuild it. This is all happening um, in, in a format where we've all got visibility of what people are doing. And this slide's just some of our um, you know, multitude of, of colourful murals and exercises. So we, we've worked um, on exercises like or tools like impact ladders you know what what are the aims and outcomes and revisiting that you know three workshops in is this really you said you wanted to go here and we've ended up here might not be wrong but but they're they're prompts to really um, make sure that we're not missing things uh, we that idea about what just the simple question that we came up with on on butcher's paper in the, the very first um, one of these that we ran, what do students need to know? What do they need to do? And what mindsets do you want students to have? And that became a very powerful repeated um, question that we asked in multiple forums. Um, you can see on the side too, we've got a more formal unit mapping version over a 13 week period with prompts around, uh, there's that knowing, doing and mindsets again, but what else is going on for those students? What's happening in their seminars? Where are the inclusion opportunities? And visually mapping that stuff that we all know and use in our practice um, has made, uh, it, it does make a difference as Susie mentioned. So just that reminder that the, the difference in this way of working, I think um, for Susie and myself um, uh, is around empathy. It's about sitting with the problem, not the solution. It's about being open and flexible, co-creating, collaborating, iterating together, doing the work together now in the meeting, not assigning someone to do it and, um, and putting their name on, a, on an action list and testing and providing multiple um, types of feedback. Here's the beautiful reference list that Susie mentioned, um, some of the things that we've been reading about as we evolve this. And, uh, and there's a lot of work in this space. So I think at this point, it's over to everybody else. Um, how do you, might you use design thinking in your context? And we can have a look at, um, I'll stop sharing this, or I can go back to share our mural board um, and put some of those questions uh, up. But uh, yes, that's that's our journey. Hey, thanks, Susie and Jen for fantastic and very informative presentation. Um, I was first introduced 
to design thinking when I was doing some uh, course in uh, human computer um, interaction design. And I thought it was for interface designer and uh, you know UX designers. But um, I can see that it's like uh, slowly merging with, uh, um, uh, with, with learning design. And uh, uh, those uh, very, very strong boundaries are fading. So that's that's very um, I think uh, and I think learning design has adapted this uh, uh, design thinking uh, because uh, because of that uh, empathy you know like that human centric emotional uh, aspect of the uh, design um, design thinking so um, that that's all great um, I would like to open this for um, uh, this space for any questions. That any of the participants may have for Susie and um, uh, Jane. I, I can see a couple of people have put in the question about applying applying design thinking to the online um, learning environment, and we've talked a little bit about using Mural for that. But um, Jane, I wondered if you had anything else to add because the, using Mural and Teams was about our, our methodology. Um, but um, I think that question's aiming at how to use design thinking to interrogate and design for online learning. Um, Jane, did you have anything to add to that? Um, Susie, yeah, look, at, it's, it, if, we, if we go back to that idea of, um, you know, mindsets and tool sets, I think we definitely um, have a, a set of, of party tricks, if you like, or tools or prompts that we that we use in that online space. But I think fundamentally for me, that difference, that shift in in going from having to suddenly having to be online, um, it opened up a lot of space for us in terms of accessibility because people were easily able to get to these sessions. Um, and in a really practical sense, um, I think it surprises people, you know, we've all lived this the last two years, not another Zoom meeting. You know, this, um, the way we structure these sessions in a design thinking way isn't, I mean, we do have a plan obviously, but it's it's not a, an agenda, a meeting. It, it actually is trying to build in as many opportunities as possible for us not to speak and to listen to the people in the room to privilege that lived experience and their understanding as we go through. So um, I think there's certainly, um, you know, practical examples that we could we could share um, around those those exercises. One of the greatest resources that when I was first um, learning about this in a, in a more formal way is the audio um, design kit. I'm not sure if, if people have seen this before. I'll quickly share it and we've got a link to it in the um, in the mural. The IDEO design kit has got a number of things that are really valuable um, that you could use in a face in a in a Zoom version of this, an online version of this. One of them is these beautiful short mindset videos on the different mindsets, and even starting with a conversation about what does that even mean for the work that we're doing here um, can be really powerful. The other really great thing, if you're wanting to dip a toe in the water around this, are uh, these detailed methods. So things like the five whys can just as easily be applied in a teaching context without not necessarily teaching students about design thinking, but embodying that, applying that to a, a subject matter um, discussion um, as, it, as it does lend itself to you've come to me and said you want an e-learn, why? Why do you want one? And, and, and using that process to, to work through. Each of these um, goes through in detail uh, with different approaches, you know, card sorts does align closer to things like um, usability UX, but there's a lot of um, a lot to explore here. Basically, um, journey maps is something we use quite a lot. Um, this gives you a little bit of an overview of what that means, and journey maps are a great one for an online context as well because they align nicely with a um, an experience of of a, a trimester or a semester. So I think Jen, uh, we have uh, some questions in um, in the chat, and uh, Louisa is asking, do you have the process for each of the stage where you are uh, uh, you are design thinking? And um, I, I think you showed that 
that website where uh, she can get the answer. But Louisa, if you have um, uh, got the answer, but if you have any more questions, you can unmute and ask uh, uh, Jane. Uh, Keith, do you, okay. did you have a question? Sorry, I was typing it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but I'll, I'll happily talk about it. Um, and thank you for that great presentation. I thought it was really, really interesting and exciting. Um, and, you know, it, it ticks all my, my learning design bones, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, my question is about competency-based training and learning design and design thinking. Um, because in my experience, competency-based training often has really quite tight, narrow um, expected outcomes. And that I feel limits a lot of the the opportunity to make use of the lived experiences of, and and you know do that wonderful sharing and relationship building um and so i was just wondering especially um jane with your experience in, in health education which i know has some elements of that as well how did you navigate that um in a way that satisfied all the parties that's a really good question um uh, and and i i would probably say i don't think uh, maybe we've never satisfied all the parties because it's it's um, an interesting it is an interesting challenge and certainly in in healthcare and uh, one of my previous roles was at a, a really large um, not for profit private hospital where it was all about accreditation and um, competencies and mandatory training um, we did manage to use this approach really successfully in a number of um, those uh, learning sort of I hate the word solution but you know I'm um, coming up with a different way of doing things um, ag again that was the classic we need an e-learn for this we've got to meet these competencies um, sometimes it's as simple as saying really so a 60 slide e-learn with all of that information that might be in a written resource do you learn one from that if you do one or do you make a cup of tea and fall asleep? Sometimes it's just that reframing is, is enough to actually um, get that message across and, and building in um, exemplars is the other classic, you know, showing people what it looks like. So um, with, a, with a project we did um, with the medicine faculty uh, last year, really high performing incredibly smart people very driven lots of, and we had to get um, something sorted very very quickly the shortcut um, using design thinking methods in that approach was to do the here's some we've prepared earlier here's some prototypes that might work what do you think about that and and that um, balance between working online and asynchronously really helps build that connection um, meeting again as a group you know the first one is always really interesting by the time you're at a third workshop people have relaxed into that and are very comfortable with um, thinking differently I think great answer thank you thank you Ben did you have a question uh, I think my question was answered by Susie it's just that I felt like a lot of times we've gone into these sessions and like I love design thinking but not everyone in the room has an idea of what it is so there's always that awkward 10 minutes of trying to explain then I remembered I should have had a whole PowerPoint slide and then thinking if you had a PowerPoint slide then the meeting would be in a whole different meeting and so it's just okay where's the fine balance between okay this is what it is and we're going to use hmm. this process. you know can we agree on this process yeah yeah absolutely uh what about James James you have any questions or comments I think that James, you make a really good point about um, needing to stay really alert in, in the moment to what's happening and, mm -hmm. and the desire to rush ahead and solutionize and make assumptions. And so that's, I think, a really important part that role that the facilitators can make. And I think for that reason, it helps to have two people there um, to spot when, when the group's kind of running away from something difficult and uh, to stay to stay in the moment. And that comes back to um, Ben's question about onboarding we we kind of flag it's going to be messy it's going to be a bit uncomfortable at times but we've used this approach and we're confident it will work and so you're preparing people a little bit to trust you and um, go with you on that journey and part of that is establishing those strong relationships and trust first um, so that um, you people are happy to work with you would anyone like to share how you're using design thinking in your practice Can 
Keith, go eight. Would you like to share? I don't, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but I, I just wanted to share one tiny little change that I've made recently. Um, and I, I used to be a big fan of creating those kind of um, uh, user persona profiles because um, I thought they were, they were really helpful ways to think about the students and their experience. Um, but after reading um, Kay McKirch's book, and she's like, do not do those kind of stereotypical profiles. Um, talk to the people with the lived experience instead. And I was like, you know what? Why don't I talk to students and help them to, you know, iterate with the next next version of the courses? And and I'm seeing that more and more in in so many different um, settings. You know that that we're not kind of taking this this assumption based on what we've already created, but we're going straight to the source of the problem, which is a little bit more fiddly. Um, and and you know, it, it it's harder, but I think you get a much more authentic response and hopefully a better outcome. Hmm. Mark. Hello, you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm with the Association of Independent Schools of New South Wales, and um, we are in the middle of organising some staff professional learning resources, though, in the form of podcasts, and they, the staff are very much up to speed with um, previous iterations and, iter and, and other kind of um, offerings. However, we've used design thinking processes to gather as much information about all the different perspectives that the staff are currently thinking and then we're, it's helping us to refine uh, the processes so that we can effectively model the, the process of putting together things like scripting, planning, organising, so that the scope of everything is really manageable. It's not an ad hoc uh, frenzied process. So we're finding it um, really good. We're using Mural uh, online tool. All of this is online because um, yeah. of the face-to-face -face restrictions. Um, and we're finding that it's going, um, it's going well for some people, but then other, other people may be a bit more reluctant. They're not as comfortable in that design thinking space or, or something. I don't know. I'm, I'm still contemplating, reflecting, self-reflecting about <laughs> the the reasons why. But um, yeah, I'm d I'm definitely a big advocate for design thinking in in learning design. Yeah, thank you. Um, anyone anyone else has any questions, comments? Anybody got any crit critiques still or? questions about whether you think it's going to work or problems you see. We've got to open up that space as well. Um, just encourage you to ha experience it where possible. Um, you can feel free to contact Jane or myself. I'll put the um, our email addresses in the chat. Um, and uh, But join in with others sessions and just have, a, have the experience because that's the best way to learn, I think. Um, but there's some great resources on our mural board as well that you might want to follow up. Yeah, hi, Susie. I just had one question. I'd be interested to know where does the innovative thinking for your team move from this creative thinking to actually doing and building the resources? Where does that point happen for you? Through conversation, I think. Um, Jane will be able to answer this a little bit better. But um, when we, we're very strategic about the work that we do, so we need to have the school um, approve the work so that the academic is workloaded for their time and we understand um, the time frames and the urgency and the priority. And so then we meet with the unit team or unit chair to um, identify what, what is in scope for the, for the project. Um, and then we outline our, our process and, and start that process, setting up a team site, um, organising some workshops. Um, the creativity is there in every moment, I would say, but so is the practicality of um, people's time and workload. I'm not sure, Jane, if you had anything to add to that. Um, I guess the only thing I'd add, Susie, is that um, getting the getting the, the balance of people um, who are in those workshops right, especially in um, you know formal organisations where certain people uh, you know have that responsibility, opening that up a bit so. Um, having uh, the people that have to do the practical boots, having some of the learning designers or the um, videographers or the people um, that, 
you you know you, we you might have heard an academic say oh they don't you know they're just going to do the thing but involving everybody in that creative team who is going to do the work and really um, pressing that do the work together approach seems to be um, what's worked for us we've certainly said it at the start not every time it doesn't work every time it works a lot of the time for us and we've seen a lot of great results but we've absolutely had sessions where we've run really rich wonderful workshops and um, the academic in charge of that unit has said thanks so much I'll just take this over here and and, and build it all myself now um, it's not it isn't for everybody it, it is quite a different way of working thanks for that thank you yeah Great. I think uh, uh, looking at the time, uh, it is a time to conclude. Um, may I request uh, our another um, colleague, uh, Keith, to conclude this session and thank the speakers. Thank you very much, Kashmir. And, and please, uh, however you like to show your appreciation, maybe in the chat window or via your emotional, your emoticons, please put your hands together to thank Jane and Susan for that fantastic presentation. Absolutely. Uh, you know, these kind of hard practical examples of how you do this uh, in, in our setting in all the challenges that we face are so valuable I think for all of us as, as practitioners as academics as learning designers whatever roles we're currently filling um, you know this is just one of the events that that's put together by the learning design SIG uh, and I noticed a few people in the chat room were saying thank you for sharing the references I'm going to follow them up and have a, a bit of a read and what I was going to suggest that if you are interested in doing that, even better than just having a read of the references by yourself would be to join the, the Ascolite Learning Design SIG reading group, um, which takes place on Teams. Uh, we will pick one of those references, we'll share it, uh, and then we're going to have a bit of an ongoing slow conversation where we can talk all about design thinking up until our next webinar. Now, we have these webinars every month. Um, and we will be uh, putting out some more information about the next one coming up. And we do have a whole range of other events coming up as well, um, including hopefully uh, some workshops um, where you'll get to try out these, uh, these ideas and things like that in a little more um, practical setting. But more information about that. The other thing that I've absolutely promised to share with you Hi, Keith, you're just muted. Can you just put yourself back on? Sorry about that. <laughs> Maybe someone doesn't want me talking about the conference. No, no, no. The Ascolite 2022 conference is coming up at the start of December, um, uh, and then it'll be in Sydney, and the plan is to have it online, uh, sorry, in person, um, which will be great. And I know the Learning Design SIG always has a big turnout for those events. So I'm really hopeful that I will see you all there. Um, in the meantime, um, if you're not a member of the SIG, please reach out to us and get in touch and we will we'll love to have you as part of the SIG. Um, but we will, be, uh, we will be present and sharing lots of learning design stuff over the next little bit. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest. Hey, it's Friday. Enjoy the weekend. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.